I hate Emily Wilde. I cannot stand her. Hi everyone, I'm Jess and welcome to the Super Bowl. I've collected best books of 2023 data from over 30 of my favorite booktubers. Today we're going to be reading and reviewing the top mentioned books. The way the video will be structured is that in part one we'll discuss my methodology, my biases, my rationale. Part two will be the results. We'll look at some standouts, maybe popular authors, and then build a five book TBR for this video. Part three is going going to be my personal opinion reviewing and ranking these books. I'll include chapters so that you can hop around, get some tea, it's going to be a long one. Let's get started. Okay everyone, we're in a void because I'm going to share my screen with you soon and we'll go through the results. But first for the methodology, these are my favorite booktubers, so our study today is inherently biased. We have 35 participants in this video. I had a total list of 38 people, but I want to mention that Carrie Can Read's video did not come across my feed, and so I purposefully searched for her in order to complete my my table and I saw that her video was posted a couple of weeks ago and I hadn't seen it. Also Sunbeam's Jess, she had just posted her video a couple of days ago so I haven't gotten to those videos yet to capture their data but they will be included in a follow-up video. The 38th person is Bella from Throne of Pages. She was away for a couple of weeks and she has not done a Best Books of 2023 video, but if she does, I will then include her data as well in the next video. These are all booktubers that I personally am subscribed to, that I watch on a regular basis, that I have a very good idea of their taste. The only new guy on the list would be Ben Reads Good. I was watching other people's videos as well, and Ben, I added to the list and subscribed because I felt like we had a couple of uh, books in common or books that I thought were quite interesting based on his description. Okay, any other disclaimers? I included Lena Norms and Carly from Uncarly. I don't think that they would describe themselves as booktubers, but I found Carly because of her, her book videos originally. I now watch all of her videos. She can just talk at me for two hours about how paint is drying on the wall and I would watch it. Lena as well well, there's a variety of interesting videos, but she is my Women's Prize for Fiction resource. So I've included both of them as well. Carly did a tier ranking of all of the books that she read last year, and I chose her top two tiers. Other methodology issues, uh, Elizabeth from Plant-Based Bride does a bracket, so I think I just included everything in her bracket because there were maybe 12 books in her best books bracket. And then two people, Leonie from the Book Leo and Stephanie Book Stephanie from Steph Stephanie Bookish did awards, which was really fun and really interesting to watch. And I've just included all of their awards as well. I think that the way that my methodology can be improved is that if I have obviously basic research methodology, having a larger sample size, maybe some sort of ordinal or uh, randomized version of this, and the then if the data was more standardized, that would be very helpful. Some people had a couple of honorable mentions. Some people put their books in order and having the last one as number one, where other people it wasn't really in order. But obviously that is out of my control. The booktubers on my list are not in any particular order, but Kayla is obviously right on top because this video is in homage to her. It's because of her. But let's have a look at the results that we've gathered from our table. I want to say that I have booked Tubers, any notes so some people ranked theirs from 10 to 1 for example there were honorable mentions uh, I included if it was a series or standalone I don't think I did this consistently but I wanted to see whether I would have to read a series or not spoiler alert I'm not reading a series in this video if any series comes up that will have to be in a separate video or a separate idea I didn't include the genre because I didn't include the genre to start with and I think that that, uh, that was a problem because it would have been really interesting to see the most popular genres or, you know, what comes up for certain people. 
but there are 500 data points on my table and so I'm not going to go back and include the genre but this would be a good improvement for next time so let's have a look and do I think let's do a quick overview just of column C which is our title and see what stands out to us from the beginning we have 1984 with two votes a Song for the Wild Bull by Becky Chambers with four. Study and Drowning 2, Alone with You in the Ether 3. We have a couple of twos here, Boy Parts, I think that's by Eliza Clark, Clark, Bright Young Women, I can't remember the name of the author, Chang Gang All Stars. Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies, I want to say that's by Heather Fawcett, I think, um, anyway, she has four votes. Uh, what is this? Happy Place, obviously, by Emily Henry. I'm a fan by Sheena Patel, four votes. Idol Burning, two. If an Egyptian cannot speak English, two. That one is quite interesting because I read it last and it's quite divisive. So the fact that two people mentioned it as favorites is really fascinating to me. Legends and Lattes, only two votes. I guess because it would have been her best books of the year before. Um, Monstrelio, I want to say Cordova, uh, but that's got three. Natural Beauty by Ling Ling Huang with four. Our Wives Under the Sea got two. Please Do Not Touch This Exhibit by Jen Campbell got two mentions as well. Then we have one of the Pauls, Prophet Song by Paul Lynch. Seven Days in June has two. St. Martin's Boycott Not Mentioned has two. So because of the St. Martin's Press Boycott, two people mentioned that they would have included that book, but they didn't mention the name. And so that's why I mentioned, I wrote specifically St. Martin's Boycott Not Mentioned. I do assume that it's their flagship book. I think if you know, you know, but because it only got two votes, I don't think it's going to affect our data anyway. The Adventures of Amina al Rafi has four. The Bandit Queens by Perini Shroff has five mentions. That's the most we have so far. The book that wouldn't burn, Mark Lawrence has three. Employees by Olga Rabin has two. That's also quite interesting because it's a translated book, I want to say from the Danish. I'm curious about it, um, but it's quite niche or obscure so i'm surprised that there are even two mentions the last devil to die obviously has three mentions i'm not surprised by that at all um because we also have the thursday murder club with one mention the very secret society of irregular witches by sangu mandana has three the writing retreat has two which i'm surprised by because it doesn't have it has a 3.4 something rating on goodreads and is quite divisive i think i rated it a three but it was i don't know i don't know it's a weird one this is how you lose the time war has three Tress of the Emerald Sea has four, of course. Okay, so we're looking at the Bandit Queens, Tress so far, uh, Ling Ling Huang, Natural Beauty. Yellow Face has three, and then You Again has two. I don't even know what that is. Speaking of Yellow Face, did Babel come up at all? I didn't notice it. Babel has one. Okay, so let's have a look in more detail for Perini Shroff. Ooh, okay. So The Bandit Queens is our overall winner as our most mentioned best book of 2023 with five straight mentions. In column B, I would have put if it was an honorable mention, for example. And so overall, The Bandit Queens won if this was a competition. <laughs> so I actually read The Bandit Queens last year. This was long listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction. This book is about... A community of women in India where we're dealing with quite a, a, some tough topics but it's also funny so it's very difficult to describe because it really strikes it strikes the balance very well so the tough topics I would say includes terrible husbands SA and then also the caste system in India which I didn't know much about so that was really fascinating to me as an outsider and then I would say that the book is really funny because we're dealing with a plot line where our main character 
is said to have killed her husband. There's this rumor. He's just disappeared. And people are assuming that she's killed him. <laughs> um, she is not denying this because she feels that it gives her a sort of sense of protection as a woman living alone, gives her a certain edge to ha- for people to think that she's killed her husband. The problem or the funny plot line comes in where other women in the community then approach her for recommendations, suggestions on how to also get rid of their husbands or make them disappear. And so if you're interested in The Bandit Queens by Perini Shroff, I would highly recommend it. It's very, very good. The Women's Prize for Fiction killed it last year. Really outstanding. So Perini Shroff, five mentions. That is our number one. Okay, let's have a look at our title column more closely. I think we mentioned Tress. We have four mentions of Tress of the Emerald Sea. Natural Beauty. Also four straight mentions, no honorable mentions. Emily Wilde. Okay, Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies. We have four mentions, but one of which is an honorable mention, but also one of which was somebody's number one book of the year. So I think that if we have a tie or toss up, then that could be interesting. A Song for the Wild Bolt, we also have four mentions, one of which is an honorable mention and one of, one of which is number one for someone. And this was also a reread for that person. I've included rereads because if I haven't read it before, then, you know, it, it, it would affect me. So the fact that it's a reread doesn't affect it, but the fact that it is a number one book for that person will affect our data. So that's quite interesting because then it really is tied with Emily Wilde. We also had I'm a Fan by Sheena Patel. Okay, so we have four straight votes for I'm a Fan by Sheena Patel. So then that pips Emily Wilde as well as a song for the Wild Bolt because the those two have honorable mentions. And I think we also need Amina. The Adventures of Amina Al Serafi, we have four mentions, but one of which is an honorable mention. So, okay. So in summary, what I'm thinking is I'm going to read five books for this video. I've already read The Bandit Queens by Perini Shroff. So we're going to look at Trace of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson, uh, Natural Beauty by Ling Ling Huang. Uh, I've just had a look and I'm a fan is a little bit difficult to find by Sheena Patel. So I'm going to source that and might have to delay that for a second video. But I do have access to Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies, a song for the Wild Bolt by Becky Chambers and then also Adventures, The Adventures of Amina Al Serafi by Shannon Chakraborty. So those are going to be our five books for this video. Let's have a look at any other standouts, maybe uh, popular authors or anything that might be interesting to us. I think I want to have a look for Stephen King probably. Five Mention. So we have a discrepancy between our most mentioned books and our most mentioned authors because Stephen King got five mentions, uh, four mentions, one honorable mention, but his votes were split. So we have 112263, Billy Summers, I've never heard of, on writing, which is his nonfiction, and then an honorable mention for The Shining. Let's just double check Brandon Sanderson. Okay, he just has Trace of the Emerald Sea. Uh, Tony Morrison also has four mentions. Sula Bluest I Beloved, so her votes are split. Octavia E. Butler usually is very popular. Only three, Blood Child, which I've never heard of, Parable of the Sower, and then Dawn as an honorable mention. I think we have to check for Emily Henry. No, not Henry Hoke, Open Throat. I don't know what that is. Oh dear, <laughs> that sounds so scary. <laughs> Um, for Emily Henry, we have Emily Bronte as well. So for Emily Henry, we have Book Lovers, Happy Place. Oh, and her votes were split. So we have four mentions for Emily Henry. 
uh, one of which is an honorable mention i'm now concerned that i'm going to have to read emily henry for a follow-up video about my favorite book she was most mentioned authors i've never read anything from emily henry i've also never read anything from brandon sanderson or stephen king so we'll see how that goes but i don't often read romance so i am a little bit concerned about that um murakami it says no rose match this filter are we sure no we're not sure maybe i spelt it incorrectly murakami is a very popular author his votes were split across norwegian wood dance 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 and then novelist as a vocation as an honorable mention which i think is also his non-fiction again i'm concerned about reading murakami because my understanding is that the way that he writes women isn't great so let's see if there are any other interesting entries let's check uh, richard osman okay yeah we have lost able to die three entries one of which was somebody's number one book and then the thursday murder club was included as well for a total of four i cannot read four books for this one video just for richard osman so i think maybe a reading vlog of reading the series would be nice and is there anyone else if you have any questions about the data or you want me to look up someone specific then let me know in the comments and i will reply and actually check for you i'm just curious about certain authors that maybe i think would be i don't know popular or often mentioned maybe t kingfisher for example Okay, so T. Kingfisher has three entries, but they're completely split between Nettle and Bone, A House with Good Bones, and then an honorable mention for Paladin's Grace. This is really quite incredible. Becky Chambers is our most mentioned author overall. So Perini Shroff got five straight votes for Bandit Queens, but Becky Chambers also has a split vote because she has a song for the Wild World, a prayer for the Crown Shy, as well as the long way to a small angry planet. So it is the year of Becky with the good hair, um, as she is our most mentioned author and beat out the holy trinity of Brandon Sanderson, Murakami, as well as Stephen King. So our overall winners, I think if we have any, would be Becky, Becky Chambers and Perini Shroff. Really, really good. Let's move on to part three, which is reviewing and ranking our top five books. I hate Emily Wilde. I cannot stand her. I wasn't going to do updates for these books because the video was going to be long enough. But I might have to DNF this. I'm about 70 pages in and my highlights are, these highlights are Emily irritating me. And I've just pulled up the Goodreads synopsis so that I can just tell you what the book is about and not give any spoilers. But essentially the synopsis describes her as a curmudgeonly professor, I agree. <laughs> uh, she travels to the far north to study fairy folklore and discovers dark fame, magic, friendship and love in the start of a heartwarming and enchanting new fantasy series. So she goes, when they say the north, it seems like it's in the Scandinavian area. The town is called her Ravensvik. And Emily is a professor from Cambridge and she's going there to do an, some academic research. No problem. I really enjoyed maybe the first 20 pages. Uh, I do like the academic focus of the book. It does include uh, it does include footnotes. Girlies love footnotes. Absolutely agree. Love it. The synopsis then says that another new arrival is Wendell Brambleby. He is her dashing, insufferably handsome academic rival who manages to charm the townsfolk. Please remember those adjectives. So let me give you some context as to why this is not going well. Let's start with her talking to Finn. We know that Emily's problem is people. She doesn't really get along with people. She's quite an introvert. She's not a socialite by any means. But she's just talking to the boy next door and he's making a great effort to get to know her and make conversation. He's asking about where she's from, about her family. She doesn't mention her parents, only her brother. And he asks if she's an orphan, which is very direct, but also um, I don't know what language they're speaking in at this point. Uh, so maybe he's being quite direct 
correct because it's his second language which can be an issue uh, but he says uh, you're an orphan and she says no I suppose people are often looking for a way to explain me and a childhood of neglect or deprivation is as good as any so already <laughs> Emily feels that she's misunderstood uh, she's she's really not like other girls but I'll give you more context for that uh, she's talking about her parents when she says I read every book in my grandfather's library I must have been eight or so and came to them with certain thorny passages memorized I expected my mother and father to offer clarity instead they had stared at me as if I had suddenly become very far away so she's very patronizing saying that she's so smart when she was eight she read all of the books in her grandfather's library her parents couldn't give her any clarification is she saying that there's stupid is she saying that they're just so shocked that their child is a genius uh, she says I brought only four dresses and some books of course she only brought four dresses and some books she also criticizes every woman that she meets or talks about so for example she's meeting a couple of people at the pub in the town and she'll say something nice, but she will make some sort of criticism. So, for example, the maiden smiled at me. She was broad-shouldered and beautiful with round red cheeks and a cascade of flaxen hair. Fantastic, right? We shook hands. Hers was large and covered with innumerable calluses. Then she's talking about Ord, one of the important elders or people in the community. She says, Ord, who looked up from her conversation with two rough-looking women to smile at me. Rough-looking, Emily? What does that mean? Okay. Um, then, oh, then I highlighted that we're being put as a reader, we're being pit against the townspeople because then they start teasing her or saying things about her, like they call you a library mouse. If you make it through the week, you shall astonish them. Bets have been placed. So we're not supposed to like the townspeople at this point, which I, I don't like that. Emily's gone to their town to do research. She's going to poke and prod. She's going to ask them questions and be a little bit of a nuisance, as we know from doing uh, academic research. But, okay. The young oh, Bumblebee has arrived. Okay, remember the, remember these adjectives. Uh, Bumblebee arrives. He's not alone. He has two students with him. The young woman, red-haired and wide-eyed, in a way that gave her a perpetually bewildered look because we can't say anything nice about women. Um, they're talking about some academic study. Bumblebee says Dan noted a similar phenomenon among the Finnish Keiju and Emily snorts. Dan invents theories to hide her shoddy methodology. You cannot generalize about such things with her sample sizes. Lizzie <laughs> Bumblebee smiles at uh, Emily sleepily and Lizzie, who is the a female student, would have been beside herself with blushes at that smile, but I was too used to him. So she's saying that the student would fall for the charms of her professor, which already is a mouthful. I, I don't need to get into that power dynamic. But she's constantly disparaging Lizzie and saying things like this about her, like, oh, sh Lizzie would fall for it, or she's giggling, or that type of thing, when Emily is constantly talking about how handsome Bumblebee is. Bumblebee then, just arriving there, demands from their hosts that they give him dinner and ask or, uh, and do ask after the possibility of dessert. Nothing elaborate. An apple tart or bread pudding will suit. The the host then comes to them and says that they they weren't planning on giving them dinner. It was breakfast only. They have other responsibilities. They run a farm. The cottage is not their main responsibility. Bumblebee then manipulates these people into making dinner for them. He says, no, no, no. I'm going to make dinner for your family. The host then feels terrible and he says, no, absolutely not. They want to be welcoming and hospitable. So we're making a stew. We'll send some down. And then he still asks about the damn dessert. He says, 
Uh, and I've no preference between the bread pudding and the apple tart. He snapped his fingers. How rude of me. Emily, dear, which would you rather? I found myself suppressing a laugh. Apple tart would be lovely. So he's being really manipulative and condescending to their hosts. And then Emily's just going along with it. <sighs> I cannot. I, I, I cannot. I, I don't think that I can continue with this. A quick interlude, this is pretty meta, but I wanted to tell you about some books that came up while I've been watching booktubers read other booktubers' favorite books of 2023. Uh, obviously, we'll start with Kayla. Kayla read and loved Emily Wilde, and so that was a big determining factor for her because she has uh, booktubers that she has books in common with and then reads another suge other suggestions by them. She then read Tress of the Emerald Sea for her video. Genuinely from the story ain't over, read A Study in Drowning, I'm a Fan by Sheena Patel, but I wanted to mention that she also read Bright Young Women and Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches for her video, and then Sid's video was suggested to me, she also read Bright Young Women and the Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches, as well as Yellowface, Mara from books like Woe read Yellowface, Hayley Fam read Yellowface, she also read Emily Wilde and enjoyed it, and Jessie the Reader whose video was suggested to me also read Emily Wilde and enjoyed it. Emily Fox is the only person who agrees with me. She read Emily Wilde and DNF'd at page 92 or 93. She reads her subscribers' favorites. And then Katie Colson did a whole research project. And I wanted to mention that Very Secret Society as well as Bright Young Women also came up. So I really want to read those soon. Um, then the others were Adventures of Amina Al-Sarafi, Trace of the Emerald Sea, Yellow Face, and Happy Place by Emily Henry. Uh, across these videos that I watched, I noticed that Seven Years Slip by Ashley Poston came up quite a few times, as well as books by Abby Jimenez. I'm not a big romance reader, but if you're interested, it seems like those are really popular recommendations and were really popular from 2023. Because none of us are surprised by a Brandon Sanderson book or a Rebecca F. Kwong book, I wanted to note just uh, one or two or three uh, smaller uh, books that have a smaller readership. And so I wanted to mention Blood of a Bright Haven by M. L. Wang because Emily Fox really loved it and I really feel that we have some tastes. Greg from Supposedly Fun mentioned this book called Whose Names Are Unknown by Sonora Bab as one of his favorites and I wanted to mention this specifically because the there's a big backstory to this book and how this book was completely buried, buried and not published because it has a similar topic or the same topic as The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck which won the Pulitzer Prize and became the number one selling book of that year. Sonora Bab's book has only been published 20 years ago when she was 97 years old and she died a year later. So even on Goodreads, there are only 2,700 Goodreads ratings. I want to include this article by the Smithsonian where there's also an implication that some of her notes while she was volunteering during this Dust Bowl era in the USA where farmers were migrating from Oklahoma to California Sonora Bab was volunteering to help these farmers and a lot of and some of her research that she was doing was included in her book but then some of her notes was given to John Steinbeck and so uh, quite an interesting story but I wanted to mention that one specifically and then lastly I wanted to mention How to Loiter in a Turf War by Coco Solid. This was mentioned by Renee from So I Read This Book what a title. This only has a thousand ratings or just over a thousand ratings on Goodreads at the time of filming. So I just wanted to spotlight a few of these lesser known books. So part three, we are finally back. It has been a while. Uh, Emily Wilde is unsurprisingly at the bottom. Yes, we're getting right into it. I am a completionist and so I felt that I should finish it. I switched to the audiobook. I should have just DNF'd it. Even the the audiobook, it wasn't as annoying, it wasn't sort of as on page and in my face, but it ended up just being boring and a drag and I felt that if I had DNF'd it, I wouldn't have missed anything. So uh, there were just, you know, a couple more small 
things that like Emily's always saying that her hair you know just falls out of a bun and sh so she's like effortlessly you know messy or whatever and I just thought it's supposed to be like that cliche where the nerdy girl takes off her glasses and uh, lets her hair down and then kiss me by sixpence and the richer plays in the background but I just I didn't care for either of them so I didn't care about their romance I was just so irritated by both of them that whether they're together or not or whether they hate each other or not I, I don't care there's one point where Wendell makes some sort of comment about her clothes being ill-fitting and he tailors them to make them seemingly more figure hugging um, but Emily is perfectly fine with her clothes and says that she doesn't want him to do that and he does it anyway and I was like oh uh, what sort of controlling Kanye West like red flag BS is this two stars did not enjoy okay let's move on i think i've complained about emily wilde enough for a lifetime so we have trace of the emerald sea amina al serafi the adventures of amina al serafi and a song for the wild bolt and natural beauty i loved all of these these were so good. So next up, we'll talk about Natural Beauty by Ling Ling Huang. I want to emphasize that there's a big gap between place five and place four on this list. Place four is a lot closer to the others than it is to place five. I just want to say that because Natural Beauty really was very surprising to me. In Natural Beauty, we're following a mostly unnamed main character who's working at a place called Holistic with a K, of course. And uh, we're just following her experience being an employee and sort of being part of the inner circle as we're finding out more and more about this company and about the group of people who are employees or owners, managers in this company. It gives goop energy it's very millennial pink the company sells products that are luxurious and exclusive beauty products and supplements and it's just out of your reach because it's out of your price range i love the mean girls vibes the bunny vibes the writing is very rich and delicious and uh it was i mean it was really excellent this is categorized as horror and i think this is the type of thing that i was looking for when doing Doing this video or when creating this TBR for myself from my favorite booktuber's favorite books because because it's horror it's not something that I would normally gravitate towards and so I think that this was an opportunity for me to read something different and I would say that it's eerie and not scary which is what I really liked about it I don't like ghosts and poltergeists and things like that I don't want things to genuinely be scary and so I never read horror and so this was a great entry point for me I felt something I really loved about this is that the main character describes how most of her time was spent throughout her childhood practicing and playing the piano both of her parents uh, were piano teachers in the book and so we're she's describing having this you know this high level of skill this very important passion where she's spending hours and hours a day on it and i don't have that <laughs> so to me that was really interesting and really fascinating the way that ling ling wong writes about music is so beautiful i think the things that i had highlighted was about music specifically and her descriptions and the feeling that music gives her or the feeling of this very specific skill. Ling Ling Huang is a violinist and so she really expresses her experience in this book and I really enjoyed that very much. Then I really struggle to separate the other three, so I'll tell you about them and then we'll rank them. We have two seafaring adventures, and now Eva and is suggesting other sea books to me, but I don't mind because I really loved these two. The Adventures of Amina Al Serafi by Shannon Chakraborty is about a female middle-aged Muslim retired pirate who's living in a quiet area out of the way with her mother and her daughter and she's left her pirate days behind her and someone visits her and she's tasked with finding a young girl who seems to have been kidnapped 
the book is a fantasy novel so everything and everyone seems normal in the beginning but then sort of these like layers of magic we discover as we go along and I really enjoyed that we're learning new things and new stories and fairy tales along with Amina and so the world goes more and more in depth and the book will be a series as well so then we can learn a little bit more about the magic in this world but what I loved about this book is the the characters Amina herself the way that she thinks about her daughter, about her family, about providing for them, about why she's doing this task, why she's going to look for this girl, uh, really is very heartwarming. I also feel that her friends, Delila is my... Delila might be my favorite character, maybe except for Amina. And then there's someone else, but I can't tell you about them. But uh, I loved Delila and some of her other friends that she goes on this journey with. The narration is fantastic. I would highly recommend the audiobook for Tress as well that we'll discuss in a second. Um, the narration was it was a performance. If you're reading it on page, it's already very good, but the audiobook performance really is so outstanding and exceptional. A movie for Amina Al Serafi, please. Loved it. Okay. Trace of the Emerald Sea is my first Brandon Sanderson, and please let me know if his other books are similar to Trace because this was so cozy and cute. This was a gift to his wife and dedicated to his wife and I think just the adorable love he has for her in an almost giddy way uh, really is expressed through this book which in itself is really beautiful but Trace is a teenage girl and she has a crush on this boy and they live on this rock it look it seems like a very small island that's surrounded by the emerald sea and the sea is emerald because it's made of these dangerous spores so essentially if you live on this rock you cannot leave which makes what trace does by leaving to rescue her crush a very big deal this was adorable in the sense that it's low stakes but it's a big adventure Tress really is a, leaving everything she knows she's leaving her home she's leaving her family and discovering herself while exploring the world the book is funny in parts in a quiet chuckling way i would also recommend the audiobook for this one really lovely Similarly, in A Song for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers, this is the monk and robot duology. There's a monk and a robot in the story. I'm not spoiling anything for you. But the monk leaves their home. They also leave everything they know. Where Trace was leaving more because she was forced to, because she had to go on this adventure to rescue this boy. Sibling Dex, our main character, the monk, is leaving because they have a restless feeling. They need something different. They need a change. And that really stood out to me. I think that this is a big theme for me right now. And we follow them as they go to different places and do tea service. And that's where they meet the most adorable robot, Mosscap. In this world, we are past the factory era where we as humans were taking advantage of robots and treating them as slaves. They all sort of become sentient at some point. Nobody knows how or why, but they obviously don't want to be living with us. And instead of killing all of us, they sort of just go into the wild to go be on their own. Moscap is very curious and seeks to answer the question, what what do humans need? This is so beautiful. I'm really looking forward to reading the second book. So this is a little bit difficult for me, but I think Amina's going straight to the top in our number one position. I think this was the most memorable to me out of the five books, the most enjoyable. I think I'm really looking forward to the, fo the following books in the series. And so A Song for the Wild World and Trace of the Emerald Sea are a little bit interchangeable for me and I think it depends on how I'm feeling but for today I think we'll put Trace of the Emerald Sea in third place and A Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers in second. 
I originally started this data collection process to build a TBR for myself from booktubers that I love, I know their tastes, I knew that I would enjoy most of these books. So I just want to thank them all for their incredible work and amazing recommendations. I'm going to read my favorite booktubers most mentioned authors because there was a discrepancy between the best books and the most mentioned authors but that is going to take a while so in the meantime perhaps you would like to watch my best books of 2023 to have an idea of the types of books that I really enjoy as well and maybe you can find some recommendations there thank you for joining me in this very long I assume very long video and I hope to see you in the next one. Have an amazing day.